So, go on to one of the morning. So I want to give them a little bit of a background. So I know because we're a little bit late, what I'd, what I'd like to do is if each of you could just briefly mention your first name. Um, Actually, I've got one of the students who's going to handle briefly the introductions for us. I'm going to turn it over to Mogotan. Very good. Buenos días, me llamo Karina Muñoz. Hi, my name is Javier Cordova. I'm Damian Williams. Hi, my name is Mitch Tooth. Hi, my name is Maha Mitchell. Good morning, I'm Kiara Kirk. Hello, my name is Misael Carrero. Buenos días, me llamo Nancy Gonzalez. Mi nombre es Ian Colin Tassin. Oh, my name is Elizabeth Kate. Good morning, my name is Renee Reed. Good morning, my name is Ashley Collins. ¿Cómo está? ¿Cómo está? Te hola. Ya me ando de aquí. Um, my name is Carol. And this is Dr. Cabanas, the head of, of the chief of the Cuban interest section to the United States, and his rank is ambassador. I'll turn it over. Well, uh, good morning, all of you. Let me put this over here. Uh, uh, Romney is a French diplomat. He's the host of the interest section. And just to start, because I will try to tell you something about Cuba that probably will provoke you to ask questions, which is usually the most interesting part of it, not to listen from me, but to interact with you. But uh, Romney has been researching on something, a link uh, about Robert Morris, the name of this institute, with Cuba, which is something very interesting. We just told the president, and we have to, we should look into that. Go ahead. Well, this is, I mean, it was very interesting, at least for us, to, to know that there is a direct link between the name of this university and, and the history of Cuba itself. You should know that back in the 18th century, you know, Cuba was still a colony of Spain. However, there was, a, you know, a sentiment of Cuban nationality that was going on already. And Spanish people and Cuban people just went together to support the independence of the 13 colonies, you know, which is a process that was certainly going on at the same time. And there was one guy called uh, Juan Miralles, which was, uh, which went to become basically with Robert Morris, who was the financial organizer of the war against uh, England. They both become the key to uh, a network of logistic support coming from Cuba to the independence of the 13 colonies. So even Washington himself, who was, of, uh, of course, the uh, first president, uh, decided to honor, you know, when he, uh, he died in, I mean, uh, Juan Mayday died in 1780, decided to honor him with all, you know, the support of the uh, politicians at the time, the organizers of the war. So to, just to honor him in, 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 because of the great support he provided to the independence of the 13 colonies. So you would say that history is a complicated thing, but it's very simple. Yeah. Uh, basically, the muscle uh, will be emphasizing the opportunities the United States uh, has with Cuba. Uh, Cuba uh, can become a, a valuable partner for the United States, and that has a deep root in history, basically. So we just wanted to share that. Did you know that? Because I didn't. And <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing it, so I, I'm happy we're at Robert Morris. Okay. Well, uh, as I said, let me provoke you with some thoughts and. Uh, probably uh, we can uh, have some exchange. Uh, in this uh, uh, institution, as I understand, uh, it prepares you for your future, like any university, basically devoted to, to business. I, I said that I like to come to universities because usually when I, I go back, I return younger, rather than older, I think I become younger. Uh, I try always to spend some time with uh, our students at the University of Cuba, at uh, Diplomacy Academy in Havana. Then uh, I regularly do this. Uh, uh, as an average, probably you know about Cuba, what we have been doing for 54 years, the kind of exchange we have with Latin America and the Caribbean. I always try to rely on geography, and then remember that more or less this is Florida, more or less this is Cuba. Jamaica is somewhere here. I just met a professor from Jamaica. Caribbean states, Dominican Republic, 
Haiti, closer to us. Here is Yucatan, Mexico. That's uh, where we are. Only that should explain something, that we share many things. We are close to each other. Spain colonized not only Cuba and some islands in the Caribbean, also colonized Florida and also colonized Mexico and basically Yucatan. For many years, Cubans move freely all around here. And uh, when you talk about traveling to Florida or to Yucatan, we were not we were not going abroad. We were just moving all around. That explains why do you have that many Cubans all over. Usually, media and other sources relate uh, Cuban immigration to the state to the fact that people left after the revolution, which is wrong. In, in January 1959, already you had 150,000 Cubans living in the states. At that time, we had a population of six, uh, six million people. And on top of that, you have a lot of Cubans coming here for work, for tourism, and they simply return. Then there were a lot more than that. Jose Marti, who is the, the Cuban national hero, has spent most of his time in the United States preparing the war against Spain. Fidel Castro, the leader of our revolution, has spent a big deal of time organizing people here to withdraw the Batista regime. Then our relation <coughs> for many years has been fluent. We have had several exchanges. Universities, well before the revolution and after the revolution, uh, have had different kind of exchange. What happened in, the, in 1959, 1959, it was a, a big change for our life. And I will invite you to research, <coughs> sorry, to research <coughs> a little bit to, uh, about to know what was Cuba before 1959. An economic, basically, address to the production of, of one commodity, which was sugar cane, nothing else, with a large per percentage of illiteracy, like many Latin American countries, 60% of the population, large unemployment, land uh, distributed in, in the foreign, uh, on the hands of, of foreign companies. And more than 50% of the farmers who live in the countryside, they didn't own the, the land they were working in. And I can go on with many other figures and many other explanations about what was Cuba before 1959. The changes in Cuba, in the way you can call it, Cuban Revolution, you have heard about socialism or communism coming to Cuba. Of course, we, what we were accomplishing there was a change a dramatic change, the same change Martí was looking for many years, a hundred years ago, fighting in Spain, the, the, the same changes many others before Fidel Castro were looking for. First, to have our own sovereignty and try to implement a model that could respond to our needs in Cuba. Now, history is a tricky thing, and uh, many changes we introduce is the changes we wanted to, we consider that will match our need, and we were forced, in other cases, to do something that probably we didn't want to, but we were simply left with uh, one option. And I will urge you, when you study history, this is a very, you cannot build the future if you don't know about history at all. Your teachers will tell you that, your parents will tell you that. Uh, you have to interpret also any, any a historical bit through different approaches. A, a historical fact doesn't have only one meaning, and the meaning uh, given to you by a book, by an author, and usually professors invite you to look in, 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 a, in different ways. And just to tell you what happened right before this year, sorry, right after this year, just a couple of examples. In that year, on that year, we have in Cuba only 6,000 physicians, only 6,000 physicians for a population of 6 million people. Due to the policy that the United States uh, applied to Cuba, 
uh, saying that any Cuban who could live uh, in the island would be very well welcome in the United States, we were left with only 3,000 physicians. Half of them emigrated to, to the United States. Then we had to implement a comprehensive program to graduate our own physicians uh, to respond to the needs of our people. Currently, we have in a population today of 11 million people, we have 100,000 physicians of the nation related to the, to the public sector. You will say, well, it's too much. Yes, it's too much. And that amount match our needs, but currently Cuba is exporting health services to the Caribbean states, to South, uh, South America, Africa, and many other countries. Fidel Castro and the revolutionary movement, they probably didn't have in mind to nationalize that many industries in Cuba. But what happened then in history in 1960? Uh, the United States took a couple of decisions that certainly put some energy on some changes that we didn't have in mind. One of them related to, to the decision that to cut the supply of oil to Cuba. You know, we, don't have, we haven't found yet. We are uh, trying to, to find oil in Cuba. But at that time, we didn't have even the, the infrastructure to look for oil around Cuba. The United States decided not to supply as a response to the changes in Cuba, not to supply oil to Cuba. And the refineries in Cuba, they were on the hands of American and companies, decided not to process oil coming from the Soviet Union. We were left with the only possibility of nationalizing the refineries and to get back our sovereignty on those, uh, on those uh, facilities. And like that, it happens in many other sectors in, in our economy. In 1961, it happened something called, in history, in Spanish, uh, La, La Victoria, Playa Giron, in English, Bay of Pigs, which is, was an invasion to Cuba uh, organized by the CIA in Guatemala that landed in, the, in this area of Cuba, which is this military action, just as an example. We have many other in our history. And then 16, 1962, sorry, the so-called missing crisis, or in Spanish, la crisis de octubre, uh, la crisis de los misiles, that was related with a, a decision from Cuba after, not, not before, after Bay of Pig to install in Cuba several facilities, defensive facilities, because it, it was evident that uh, we couldn't wait only for, for the worst coming from the United States at that time. Because we took that decision to defend ourselves when the, the whole world was on the brink of, of, of a nuclear war, we were able to overcome that through peaceful meaning, and hopefully that experience uh, uh, teaches a lot for everybody how you have to deal when you have an uh, international crisis. What I mean is basically that after 1959, our relationship with the United States uh, has been, uh, has had different political cycles that at what we are facing, and when, when I say we, is you in the United States and we in Cuba, that the situation we are facing now is based on decisions that were taken at that time, many, many years ago. Uh, it's only a reference for you reading in the books or your family telling you what happened. It, that is only a reference for your generation and even my generation. I'm older than you, but even for my generation, it's, it's basically a reference. But the main pillars of the current policy towards Cuba were built at that time. And since that time, many things have changed in the world in Cuba, in the United States. At that time, the State Department uh, went with a policy to try to isolate Cuba from Latin America. And I have to say, they accomplished that. At, some, at that time, we had relations in the area only with Mexico and Canada. The rest of the, of the country uh, broke relations uh, with Cuba. 
among the main changes we are facing these days is, is now the other way around. We do have not only bilateral relations, but diplomatic presence, I mean, offices and, and embassies all over the Caribbean and in all the rest of the country, Central America and South America. And we have, we don't have bilateral relations with the United States, but we do have some diplomatic presence here, and the State Department has, because the intersection technically under the Swiss embassy. Uh, technically, I'm a Swiss consul. Romney is a Swiss uh, consular as well, because we are attached to the Swiss embassy. It's a, it's a tricky thing in order to be able to open uh, the, the representation there. Those changes came in 1977 during uh, the Carter years, uh, Jimmy Carter years in, in power. Uh, most people associate this possibility only with Carter years, but as a matter of fact, we were debating uh, that possibility from well before, I mean, from uh, uh, Gerard Ford's years in, in power. But this is something that was accomplished during the Carter years, and during those days, I mean, was the vision of President Carter that we should have, have and sign, and we did it, bilateral uh, agreement on several areas. I think in some way the, the Carter's vision was considered that, again, we are neighbors. As some, uh, someone put it here in the United States, we share the sea, we share the winds, and we share the, the, the movement of people coming back and forth. And we have to represent in some way the interest of our own people. Let's say from our side, well, a lot of Cubans who have relatives here, and a lot of uh, Cubans right here who have relatives back in Cuba. Then you can, I can tell you from the diplomatic point of view, you can say, well, I don't want to have any relation with you. That's okay from the political point of view. But from the consular part of it, if at some point in your life you are involved in diplomatic affairs, I will invite you to consider that. But from the consular point of view, you don't have bilateral relations, but you still have to represent the needs of those people who are not political. I mean, if you need to have a passport, you have to have a consular officer there to take the information about you, to provide the, the documentation. If you have a son and you want to register a son as a Cuban citizen, well, you need to have a, a consular officer. And the same thing happens with the Americans in Cuba. They have the same need. The American community in Cuba is not that large, but still there are some instances that have, have to be represented. I mean, in this light, it's not what you want to do, it's what you actually have to do. You, you are forced by the, the, the circumstances. Uh, and again, they, uh, the fundamental pillars of the policy, the, the current policy of the United States, are presided by a, a policy of blockade. It is called here embargo. Embargo is a very limited definition of, of it, and it, it, it uh, encompasses only bilateral measures taken a, against one, one country. We call it blockade because it's a more comprehensive policy that affects not only bilateral relations of Cuba with the United States, but the relation of Cuba with other countries. In these last years, no matter what has been said about changes of President Obama in regards to Cuba, I can tell you, and this is public, that this year we have, the la we have had the largest fines imposed on foreign banks for having relations with Cuba. OFAC, which is the Office of Foreign Asset Control. It's, a, it's, a, it's related with the Treasury Department, I and mean, it's part of the structure, and it's there to track and follow transactions that are dangerous for the United States, let's say money linked to Al-Qaeda and terrorist groups. Well, regrettably, most of the, its budget and most of its personnel is related not to track those guys, it's to track Cuban operations with the world. Hopefully, this is something that uh, would be changed at some point. Uh, during the Obama administration, at least a couple of uh, decisions were taken. They are positive. Probably they will lead to something else. One of them is uh, related with the possibility of Cuban Americans to travel freely to the country. That's a, a positive level that takes the amount up to 400 
6,000 Cubans, Cuban Americans, coming to the island every year. Then usually you have the image or the perception that between Cuba and Miami and Florida there is a wall, that nothing is happening there. Well, no. That is a, a huge exchange. People are coming and going. And uh, we have implemented in the last year, and probably we'll have We'll take some questions regarding that because not to have this introduction more much longer. We, we introduce a, a new migratory policy. The Cubans are free to travel anywhere they want, only having a passport. In the first eight months of this policy, more than 187,000 Cubans have traveled abroad, including the United States, and they go back to Cuba. The restrictions that were imposed before were imposed because of this. When we lost that many <coughs> physicians and educated people, we have to uh, preserve the, 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 the labor force we, we have in Cuba. We don't have to do it anymore. We, we are a right society, and we do believe that people can travel all over. As a consequence of that, and I have to tell you, instead of people leaving the country, you have people returning to the country. Cubans go, they see what is the world, and they love much more what they have at home, and then they return. That's it, what is happening these days. And the second uh, measure that uh, was implemented, uh, another one, that was implemented contrary to what OFAG is doing, and this is very negative, but something that a development which is positive, is related to uh, uh, establishing what they are called people to people. Uh, programs uh, starting in 2010-11 uh, that uh, OFAC provides for some categories of, of uh, projects to have people uh, going to Cuba under religious license, uh, research licenses, and uh, some other. It's a still a painful procedure. I mean, you have to fill a, a lot of forms, but at least that's a procedure that for universities. Uh, is it creates a possibility of exchange, of bringing in students. Of course, we are inviting you. We are we, we talk to the to the president. It will be a, in the past from Chicago. We welcome uh, a lot of uh, groups in Cuba, and it's a possibility for you to, to talk with our students, to ask them what they think about that, to share experience with you, and it's also a, a, a way to build peace for the future. If you become friends and you understand better from your own view. What is happening in Cuba, of course, you, you will have a completely different approach than the one provided by some media of, of, for some ill-hearted uh, people. Illinois and Chicago, particularly, benefited uh, from a, a waiver here in Norfolk that was approved in the year 2000 that allows some companies to sell food and medicine to Cuba. Then. The blockade is a comprehensive policy. It, it, it has what we can call it a loophole, but it's a very limited one because that possibility is provided only if we, I mean, Cuban companies pay in cash, in advance, without credit, with, without using our chips, and it's only a one way trade. I mean, you cannot import from us. And I can tell you. Our economy is not anymore a mono production thing in agriculture. We are not producing even that much sugar cane anymore. Our economy is a, is a service oriented economy with uh, tourism leading as a main sector, a lot of mining, a lot of biotechnology, and uh, another sector that is coming. Uh, forward and will represent a large income to Cuba, which is computer sciences. We do have a, a university in Havana, we have several faculties. Well, just to complete probably the picture of Cuba, in 1959 we had formerly only two universities, one in Havana, one in Santiago, Cuba. Today we have 50 higher education institutions or faculties related to one particular subject. In the case of computer sciences, we have 
among other faculties, one uh, university in Havana only devoted to that. We have graduated 10,000 students from there that are uh, being part of different efforts in our economy. And with a proper infrastructure, uh, we will, this is a sector that will develop a lot in Cuba in the years ahead. Probably you, you hear from time to time that our access to internet is limited. And some people link to that with political decisions. Cubans don't like people be knowledgeable about what happened in the world. It's exactly the opposite. But the same people don't tell you that our connectivity with the world is through satellites. Because we are not allowed, I mean, Cuba is here, and let's go back to the map. Cuba is surrounded by several networks of uh, uh, optic fiber that most of them hook here in Miami, hook in Fort Lauderdale, and hook in many other places. You have to be on those networks to connect to Europe and other places. Well, we are not allowed to do that. Why? The same policy approved here. We recently installed a, a fiber optic cable, cable connected to Jamaica and Venezuela. We are starting to, to use that, hopefully, and that will provide us with uh, new opportunities. But that cable is connected with those networks. I mean, it's a business that is basically regulated from the uh, United States. The introduction was long. I would have to, I would love to have it shorter, but just to give you, give you a glimpse of uh, what we were, what we are doing bilateral relations. We are at the middle of a comprehensive process of, uh, some people call it reform. We call it updating of our model, correcting things we did wrong in the past, or we learn how to do it now. Because believe me, to build a new society is a very complicated thing. We have very clear that what is, what Cuba was in 1959 was wrong. We had to build a new society, a more fair society, Regrettably, we were not able to do it peacefully because of everything I explained that happened all around us. We had to, to spend a lot of time, effort, and money trying to defend us, and then we were not focused on the on the main subjects. Well, the main subject was to survive precisely and to, to keep our country running, but a lot of efforts were left without that much attention to the economic field and the economic uh, opportunities. Now we are correcting that. We are having a lot of new uh, private and cooperative uh, companies established in Cuba, uh, a comprehensive movement of labor force from government to those uh, companies now have a more compact uh, government only for regulatory uh, uh, issues. And many other things that probably would be of interest for you if you uh, want to ask about that. Then the floor is open. You are, you, are the, you are the boss, you regulate I'm, No, I'm not the BS. I like to think of myself that way, but they don't necessarily. But one, it has definitely been an honor and a pleasure. I do want to excuse one of my students because he has a midterm exam to take. Okay. So Mitch, if you, and the others, I'll ask you guys to sit for just a few minutes, and I will contact your professors and let them know. We're running a little behind schedule. Um, but guys, you have, let me open the floor for a moment and see if there are any questions that you guys may have. Okay. Anyway, good luck in your test. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and let um, Mr. Taylor contact you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Who are Cuba's main trade partners at the moment? We, we know you're buying on a cash basis from the United States vendors, but who would be your major trade partners? Today are China, uh, Venezuela, Vietnam, in some way uh, uh, Spain, in some way Mexico. Uh, basically, they are the, the, main, the main partners. Uh, in some way, we have to. We cannot say that we have United States in our list of partners because if you have trade being performed in one way, then the, the word partner is not correct to, to use it. But just to give you an idea, in ten years, we spend here in the United States five billion dollars, which gives you an idea of what. And, and then five billion dollars in cash in advance without credit not using our chips, and only one way. Just to give you an idea of what we could accomplish if those limits are, are lifted. 
you have the question. Or at least you raise your hand. Yeah, so you said that um, you guys kind of re regulated your, your energy sources and all that due to the model that we had in the U.S. Uh, I think we just passed a law that um, they're going to actually deregulate that. Are you guys, is that something you guys are also working on? Well, we, we are looking into that with a different approach. Uh, we have, as you know, a lot of sun, which I miss here. <laughs> I mean, it's the same sun, and now we suffer the consequences more stronger in, in, in Cuba. <laughs> and we realize that we can make a use of that. In our way of doing things, the regulated is not what actually uh, put the synergy for people to look uh, better on that opportunity. What we have to do is to find a way, and we are doing that. We are investing, first we are investing heavily in state money to, to develop that sector. Not only uh, solar energy, but winds, uh, waves, anything that, that produce uh, biomass, anything that produce uh, energy. What we are doing, and for example, some cooperatives in the, in the country, I mean, in agriculture, they are not connected to the national system of, of power energy but because they do have enough biomass to produce their the, the own energy. What we are trying uh, to do is to have some uh, stimulus you know, in, on budget for people that if they do work with alternative energy, then they have, for example, in, this, in the tax system, they will have some benefits and, and then trying to, to, to accomplish that. In the field of energy, we are still drilling for oil from here. And we have, among the, the, the few things we have agreed on, I mean, the United States and, and Cuba, and in, the, in this case, Mexico, we have like an agreement and understanding about how to share the economic uh, uh, zone in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's clear where the borders are from the United States, from Cuba. And considering those borders, now we, are, we have divided this area, more or less this area, in what we call blocks in order to conduct uh, offshore drilling looking for, for oil. Because it's there. Every study conducted says that it's there. From your side, from our side, from European companies, it's there. In, in the case of oil, you have to be quite precise in drilling in the right place because you drill 10 meters to the right, and, and you don't find it, and, and this is still uh, there. For that, we have a lot of uh, companies from all over the world, uh, from Norway to China to Vietnam to Angola to Indonesia to Malaysia, from many countries coming here, uh, spending a lot of money on their own risk in order to, uh, from Brazil, from Venezuela also, in order to find uh, oil there, this is definitely an opportunity that American companies are, are losing as well. Then you have a lot of people in this area, basically Texas, in that area that could be part of that uh, venture. They are, they, they are not taking the profit, nor even uh, as at, uh, out, outsourcing services that, uh, to provide for those uh, companies. That's more or less what I can tell you about the energy sector in, in Cuba. I was going to ask you, Mr. Nestor, will you have a few minutes? Because one of the things I may need to do is let some of the students, I do have some students who have a 10 o'clock class, not many of them, and I think there are three more. And what I was going to do is ask the others if you can stay, because this is a wonderful opportunity for us. So, But I don't want to hold too many up to have, because we're on our midterms. So those of you who have a class, I know there's two more students. Can I have you and the guys for the rest of you to stay for just a few minutes? Because this is a great opportunity. I want to give you a chance to ask your questions, too. So I'm just going to excuse a couple more. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay, great. And then, I know Nancy, you had a question. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. When do you think the United States government going to stop considering Cuba as part of the axis of Evil, as President Bush described with other countries of Syria and Korea? Well, the, everyone knows that that's a political decision. Uh, if uh, the, that phrase, which is a, a Bush phrase, is a yeah. Bush creation, mm -hmm. but Cuba was included in the so-called list of uh, countries that sponsored terrorism in 1982. If you go back to the document, and, and you can take quotes from the document, what it said, why Cuba was included there, 
work because we were supporting the Sandinista uh, movement in, in Nicaragua. They are in power today. We were supporting the Faraundo Martí Liberation Front in, in El Salvador. They are in power today. And many years after, you, you can ask, well, were we doing the, the right thing or, or the wrong thing? But those were, those were the reasons. At the time of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan as, as a president, and the uh, uh, East-West uh, conflict and the contention of communism in Latin America, well, that at that time we were considered to be placed in, in that, uh, in that, on that list that explained uh, works as an argument to keep that policy in place. I mean, that, that's what, what, that, that is one. It's tomorrow morning it's decided that we are not uh, part of that list many of those pillars will go down and we will be in a position to have better relations. Is it still there? Many uh, administrations after Ronald Reagan considered that it was risky to take Cuba out of the, of the list because of the signal that that could provide. Cuba is still an example for many people in, in Latin America. Uh, the most important thing is that happens on February, on, on sorry, on January 1959, there was a, a book that was published in Cuba uh, some years ago. I had to do uh, something with that because I was head of archive of the ministry, and we published the exchange of verbal notes between Cuba and United States from 1959 to 1961. It's a very interesting story because it was the first time you had. A foreign country, a third world country, telling the United States, you cannot do this, this, and this. You have to behave, you have to perform well in Cuba. I mean, that, that was not the kind of language the State Department was used to, to listen from a foreign country. And then you have to pay a price. I mean, if you face the, this is mine. If, if you want to face the big guy in, in that way, but then you, you, you suffer the, the, the consequence. But after this decision, which are the arguments that have, have been the use? Well, some member of uh, ETA, the <coughs> Basque movement in Spain, uh, have visited Cuba or they live in Cuba. Well, I can tell you, they are there because the, Sp the Spanish government, the Spaniards, ask us to take this people to Cuba. And they are under the supervision of the uh, Spanish embassy in Havana. They know that it's not an argument. Another argument, Cuba hosts some operative from FARC, Colombian guerrilla. But you know what? They are negotiating peace in Cuba. We are hosting not only FARC. We are, only, we are hosting the Colombian government and probably you're informed, if, if not, you can check in on internet how many rounds of, of talks they have had in Havana looking for peace. No fighting each other, no killing each other, just negotiating peace. <coughs> then, this, this is not valid, this argument. This is not valid. And then, if you read the last report about countries sponsored to terrorism, you, you will see clearly that there are no arguments anymore. No argument. The United States cannot talk about any terrorist action performed in the United States from Cuba. Mm -hmm. We do can say the opposite. I mean, a lot of terrorist acts has been performed in Cuba from the United States, or at least with the blind side of the US authorities in regards to terrorist groups uh, operating in, in Miami. Who do you think benefits the most? Um, actually, um, Nancy, I'm going to ask you to hold the question only because I've been told mm -hmm. keeping the ambassador on his schedule, we only have time for one more question. So can I ask a very general question? I understand that you were in town to talk to um, some of the business leaders in yeah. the city about yeah. how we might collaborate and create partnerships. One of the things that we encourage our students to do is seek experiential learning opportunities. I wonder if you might comment briefly on some of the things that our students might do to give them some of the opportunities you're trying to create here in the city of Chicago? Well, uh, the, the most important one, I, I would say, is as I, we, we talk with the authorities here and the president, is to be part of, uh, 
of any student exchange. This is something that we can work on. Well, you can always read and to know more about Cuba. Of course, that, that, that would be useful. You can always read and learn more about the, the foreign policy of your country, because in a few years, you will have responsibilities, probably in local government, in federal government, in private business. But the foreign policy can be uh, established from every, any corner. Here in Illinois, you have a, com a large company like uh, ADM that was involved in the, the first visit from any uh, US go uh, governor in 1999. Uh, uh, governor Ryan from this state came to Cuba and the private sector accompanied him. Then you don't have to be only at the State Department to be influential in, in, in conducting uh, foreign policy. Uh, but definitely, if uh, the university, or these students, you can be involved in any kind of uh, exchange with Cuban students, that will be great. That will help you to have knowledge about uh, a different country, to share with your people here. A month ago, I, I accompanied my general director for uh, US Affairs in the ministry to a presentation that she had at Columbia University, that is one of the ones that survived that many changes in, in bilateral relations, and they have a lot of uh, exchange with uh, Cuban University. And when she finished, and people were clapping, there was a student at the end saying, well, uh, in a month, we are, we are going as a students. We, do, we have a list here. How many of you they will have to go? Because they do have a license. I mean, you have to have a license to do that with uh, OFAC. But uh, the students were actually leading the, the efforts. Those will be my, my comments. So those are opportunities for students. Well, Ray, I've been told that you were on a tight schedule, and I was informed that I need to wrap. Can I ask my students to join me in thanking you very much? This has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you.